I think about Web2 Media as having this this sort of trilemma where it's like pick pick two of the three things that you can actually do really well. And so those three things are distribution, uh, tools for, for creation, and revenue share. Web3 naturally solves for this. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Steph Alinsig. If you don't know who Steph is, she's a DAO media expert who leads media efforts at the Seed Club. And if you don't know what the Seed Club is, it helps builders launch DAOs. She's also host of the Decent Media Podcast. Steph, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm so well. Thanks for having me, Michael. I'm super excited that you're here. Today, Steph and I are going to explore media in a decentralized world. Now, before we go there, I want to hear your story. Start wherever you want to start. How the heck did you get into Web3 and DAOs and all this fun stuff? Oh, man, start wherever I want to start. Boy, we can. <laughs> there's lots of places to start there. Well, yeah, I, you know, I onboarded to Web3 last fall basically at the height of the NFT bull market. And prior to that, I'd spent about a decade plus building mission-driven brands um, in Web2. So, you know, I, I did this through full spectrum brand strategy um, from, you know, graphic design to content creation to social media management, which, I mean, as you know, I, your you know, social media examiner is one of my very old toolkit um, p- pieces in my toolkit. Um, but yeah, I, I had been hearing about crypto and Web3 and finally just you know, my curiosity peaked. Um, I listened to an episode of A16Z's podcast on NFTs, and they they cover you know tokens end to end, and they started talking about this idea of a DAO, decentralized autonomous organization, and it like was immediately legible to me because they essentially fused my experience of branding and storytelling and community building, um, and in particular, I've always had an interest in media and storytelling and. And how social media of you know the mid audience sort of required brands to develop with this content creation mechanism and have that included in their brand strategy, um, but but overall was like very dissatisfied with the arc that social media had taken, um, and, you know, in the way in which like email sort of became the way to keep customer information and maintain that direct line to, to customers. So hearing about hearing about DAOs and the ways that tokens sort of enabled this new uh, connection to community building and to your customer was just again, immediately legible and just got me so excited about what was possible with with media and and branding. So tell us about how in the world you connected with Seed Club. Like, tell us that story. How did you find Jess? How did I find Jess? So one of the things that I am really good at is basically poking around the internet and talking to people. And it's like one of, one of my superpowers. And so when I onboarded to when I onboarded to Web3, that essentially looked like me just standing up a Twitter account under the uh, pseudonym Crypto Honey, which is crypto and then H-U-N-3-Y. It was like a play on crypto punks. I thought it was really clever at the time, but it's kind of funny to, to look back a year later and it feels a little silly, but I'm, I'm sticking with it. Uh, and yeah, and just was just like started following a bunch of people on on Twitter. And, um, you know, you can- when, when was this? Yeah, this was de- December, like December 1st or something of 2021. So really a, a year ago. Um, yeah, zero followers and knew nobody in crypto. And so just like, we got was poking around, poking around crypto Twitter. And, you know, at the time, most folks were pointing, most most DAOs or brands were pointing people to join the Discord to like kind of tap into the community. So I was like, all right, so set up a, set up a Discord account. And similarly, just like joined a ton of Discords. And same thing, just like talking to people in the chats, um, you know, that there was a clear need for storytelling at the time. Like, there weren't that many writers or people creating content. I was like, well, that's something I'm, I can do in my sleep. I've been doing for over a decade, so why not? And so I just started, you know, writing or, or doing things here and there. And, you know, just it was like one of those stories. You just happened to be in the right place at the right time, talking to the right people, doing the right things. And, you know, a year later, here I am. Um, so it's, 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 it's. I feel like it's often a dissatisfa- a dissatisfactory story for folks because they kind of want the roadmap. They're like, okay, how can we do the same thing? And I'm like, really, it's just a matter of following your curiosity and talking to people. Okay, so you went ahead and got involved in Discord, and that's where you met Jess Loss, I would imagine. And somehow, some way, you guys started collaborating together, and that ultimately led to him offering you a job. I mean, can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, totally. So it's um, right. So I this this like right right place, right time, right people thing. Um, takes the shape of me basically doing some work in collaboration with someone else who was in a sub DAO of Seed Club at the time. And in basically doing work with that person, they were like, you know what? And they worked at Seed Club at the time. This person's name was John Silky. Hey, John, if you're listening to this. And uh, yeah, John was just so impressed with this like little thing I wrote that he was like, why don't you come try contributing over to Seed Club? 
Um, and I, you know, was a little, I was a little suspicious at first. Um, cause I, I'm, I'm always a little, uh, yeah, like just if, if I don't know the people that are there, I'm, I'm like, oh, I don't really know if it makes sense for me to invest time and, and energy in a thing where I don't know the people that well. So, um, I was like, let me, let me first talk to Jess let me meet this person. Let me meet the team and see if it, see if it is a good fit. And, um, yeah. And so he just put me in touch with Jess and, um, you know, I started, I started contributing sort of part-time just you know, doing light content creation. I eventually took over the Twitter and then went on full time two months later. And then after about five months of contributing, uh, basically just pushed my, you know, pushed my way through to, to what we call what we call the timer steward. So essentially just leading this component of work. Um, and it really came out of a, like a, uh, yeah, like I, I'm looking at the breadth of this organization. I see an opportunity, I see an opening and I see way in which I can really clearly contribute value and just pursuing that sort of relentlessly and 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 yeah and then that's that's really it's just a story yes a story of uh of yeah of of that so let me ask you this question were you um at the time did you have another job somewhere else was this a side hustle and also what kind of writing what kind of content were you helping to create for them and what are you doing these days so i at the time of December, when I, when I first onboarded into crypto in uh, December 21, I was running my own boutique studio at the time, and um, I had done my done my time, you know, working for uh, like smallish corporate, um, done my time working for uh, nonprofits or think tanks, and so I was doing doing my own thing, um, taking on clients, and just running a small studio. And after about a month or two of of again, just like kind of knocking around crypto Twitter knocking around discords, I realized that I need like, it was like, this is the thing I want to be spending my time working on. And so I made the decision um, January 1 of, of, of 22, basically to shut down my studio within a couple months. So um, by the time I was, I was contributing part time for Seed Club at around February, I was at the same time um, letting go of the clients, like kind of closing out the work that I'd been doing with, with the set of clients that I still had. And so it really was this kind of like elegant transition. Um, so I spent those those first two months that I was uh, part time. I was like really shutting down the studio, you know, closing out projects with clients, and then was able to go in full time uh, at the beginning of April. And yeah, and so what what kind of content was I creating? You know, really was like just writing tweets, writing copy, um, kind of doing this thing that I do a lot when I'm new with a client uh, is is just witnessing and paying attention and listening and looking for patterns and hearing the words that people are using and trying to understand why those words and what's the story behind those words and where can we take those words further. And um, and so and then also at the same time, paying attention to the way in which the public or the, or the folks on Crypto Twitter were, were perceiving Seed Club and seeing where the gaps were from where Seed Club was desiring to be perceived and what was actually what the actual perception was. And um, and so that was my first uh, my first sort of like order of business was to just close that gap uh, to, to bring those two things into greater alignment. Um, and that and that just like felt it's just a way that I've always run my like initial relationship with clients is is just starting by closing that gap, and then from there going and um, expand you know expanding into into new territories and and making those tendrils a little bit longer. So now take us up to the present. Like, what exactly are you doing for the Seed Club today? So for Seed Club today, um, yeah, you know we're we're about to embark on. Um, let's see. Be, it's 2023, so we're you know Q1. We're going to be in the the thick of planning out our first quarter, and then also our our big 2023 year. You know, def definitely different market conditions. So we're um, we're slowly but also urgently or intentionally um, adjusting adjusting our strategy. But really, that just it. What I do now, it's just lead. You know, continuing to lead on a really dynamic uh, media strategy. So that covers um, the the four verticals that I that I sort of. Uh, oversee our uh, editorial um, brand uh, productions, which includes our podcast and video um, and then social and publicity. So it's a full spectrum of work. And, you know, previously we were running those verticals with like individual leads on each of, you know, on each of those uh, teams. We've since sort of constructed quite a bit just to both re you know, really, really respond to what we see as a, a, a need to, to continue to focus and and really, and really um, emphasize for quality of, of product that we're shipping, right? Because it's a, it's just a different strategy you have to take when you when you're working in these kinds of market conditions. So, but we're still going to continue to to execute on that dynamic strategy. And I'm really excited, actually, to 
to facilitate that with just like a way more, a smaller and more focused group of individuals to really put things out that are highly resonant with folks. Well, first of all, thank you for allowing us to go deep on your story because there's so many people listening to this podcast right now that are like you. They're creators or they're writers or they're editors or they're involved in the Web2 world and they're trying to figure out a way to take some of their gifts and skills and apply it into this Web3 world. And for you, for them, your story is inspiring. So, mm-hmm. you know, talk to us a little bit about what's wrong with media from your perspective in Web2. Um, I think I kind of know because I run a Web2 media company, but I would love to hear your perspective. Oh, man, I feel, I feel like I'm like, say, give, you know, giving this sp- spiel to a, a, a juggernaut, a very like, you know, experienced person in this world. So um, yeah, take this all the grain of salt. But yeah, you know, from from where I from where I sit and I and I look at um, my both my experience with Web2 Media um, and then also seeing the opportunity ahead of us in Web3, I think about Web2 Media as having this this sort of trilemma where it's like pick pick two of the three things that you can actually do really well. And anyone who gets all three, anyone who, who nails all three is really going to the moon, right? But no one has quite figured out how to nail all three yet. And so those three things are distribution, uh, tools for, for creation, and revenue share. And with, um, so if you think about distribution, that that's sort of like built in, right? That's the network. So that's like the, you know, your follower count. That's um, any of your, anytime that anything's liked, your impressions, that's your that's your distribution. Your The, pro, the, the platform sort of provides that for you. Um, and then tools for creation, that's a, that's a really critical, a really critical moat for social media, right? We see TikTok really leaning in and, and, and leading there with their video um, their video creation tools in a way that like Meta and others and, and um, YouTube just like haven't quite figured out how to nail. Um, and and if we think about even Instagram way back, right, that like the thing that the thing that was like the big insight for them was was enabling way more people to become photographers through the through the use of of filters and and utilizing the um, the the camera that's in your pocket, which right, it's like what's what's the best camera? It's the one you have on you. Um, so right, distribution, tools for creation, and then the final one is revenue share, which very few platforms have actually figured this out, right? Like, uh, and I think I think we sometimes you hear monetization, and it's like actually most platforms have figured out monetization, right, through ads or subscriptions. But actually, the next level down is revenue share. Like, are they are they then waterfalling that revenue down to the folks, the creators, the hard side of the network? Um, and most most are not. You know, YouTube is is taking a stab at this. Um, OnlyFans, I think Twitch might do a little bit, but you know, the no one has quite aligned all three of those things distribution tools for creation and revenue share and to me i'm like there's you know whoever whatever web two, whatever web two social figures that out is you know you guys are you guys have got it so this is fascinating to hear you identify these things distribution first of all there's a real challenge with distribution now on the social platforms especially for certain kinds of content right almost all the social platforms d um d distributor minimize the reach of uh, any content that doesn't live on platform, right? We learned this the hard way you link to your blog or anything else. There's almost no chance you're going to get any distribution. Uh, Tools for creation is also intriguing because um, the platforms used to make it really easy for you to do it, but now not so much anymore, right? Like, for example, there was notes on Facebook, which were really popular, which would make it really easy for you to to create content on Facebook. Uh, There was instant articles which are being eliminated, right? So there's a lot of this kind of stuff that is now, uh, the tools for creation now seem to be by third-party providers, right? And um, distribution obviously is the big thing we all want as marketers, but it's almost the impossible thing to get these days without paying money. And then like you said, monetization, YouTube is the only one that I would say is even close to this, right? Because right now, as of today, 55% 55% of um, the long form content, I forget what they call them, the longs or whatever, on YouTube, 55% of that revenue goes back to the creator. But with shorts, they flipped it where it's only 45%. So this is a struggle. So um, what's the result of the, I mean, this this trilemma concept that you're talking about, um, you know, I get what it means, but like, I'm curious from your perspective, Like, do you feel like it's all kind of falling apart in the traditional Web2 world? Because you've got a lot of major media entities that have gone out of business because uh, Facebook has stopped traffic to their site, right? Um, Twitter has now revealed impressions. You know, when you tweet, they show you exactly how many impressions that you get. And you'll start to notice the stuff that doesn't have a link in it gets more impressions than the stuff that does have a link in it. Just curious what your thoughts are on that. 
Yeah, I, I mean, my my take is like Web two social is not going anywhere. Like, like we'd be we'd be like intellectually dishonest if we claimed that like there was a going to be like a radical end to Web two social and that and that you know anything anything that we're doing in Web three was gonna was gonna somehow just like make those things non existent. That that's just not that's not true. Um, but yeah, the thing I, I see I see sort of two things um, happening at sort of like the dissolving of of these Web two social platforms is one, they're just like, they're just like not fun to be on. Like, I really do not enjoy being on Instagram. I really do not enjoy being on TikTok and, and, and or TikTok, not so much, but Twitter. I really don't, I really don't enjoy being on either of those platforms, but because of the distribution, I, I have to, right? It, it's, it's like part of the job. It's part of being someone who's in media, um, being someone who's committed to building a personal brand. It's like, you have to be on those platforms. So that's part of the, like, you know, being intellectually dishonest, saying that those things are going to go away. They, it's highly unlikely they will, right? But they still just like totally there's like the, the sense of delight in discovery is just gone. Um, TikTok has I think TikTok has has done a better job at the sense of discovery and, and distribution. But still, it's it's just it's, you know, the, the quality of what you're discovering there, I think, also speaks a lot to what the, the sense of enjoyment. And then the other part that you're pointing to, you know, there was um, back when I was you know taking classes at J school um, and there was this whole like, you know, utilizing the social media um, platforms as as your distribution for your for your media site, right? So like you you then would have to optimize all of your all of your stuff, all of your content um, to then to to fit within some sort of either embed or or just to have some uh, sense of I, I, clickbait is is too reductive if you know what I mean, but just a sense of like attractiveness to the to the users of social media platforms. And now that we're seeing that go away, uh, we're watching you know the the Verge has really has really gone after this in a big way. We're watching uh, media sites really try and go back and, and bring bring folks right to their to their sites right to have direct traffic to the sites rather than trying to rely on the, the social the social networks for um, for distribution so I see you know I see web 3 is playing a really critical role in in solving for this continued dissolve I don't see it as necessarily just you know getting rid of that altogether but um, but yeah I, I, I do see and this is what excited me about web 3 this is why I like shut down my studio to go all in I was like this is really the next the next evolution of media and of social media is Web3. Perfect. So let's talk about that. Like, what is the media opportunity in your mind when it comes to Web3? Yeah. So, you know, I talked about this, this trilemma in Web2 and um, the, uh, you know, Web3 naturally solves for this, right? Um, so if we if we just to review back to the trilemma of Web2, it's distribution tools for creation and revenue share. Um, I'm going to pop start with revenue share. In Web3, this actually gets, uh, you know, uh, twisted into um, value value retention, right? you know, and and that's all enabled through tokens, right? So let's let's look at let's look at YouTube, YouTube for a second, where you get you get the monetization, you get the revenue share from, um, you know, from 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 YouTube, right? But you don't you don't have any of the the value retained in the brand of YouTube itself, right? Imagine if you actually had like equity share on YouTube, like that's incredible. Um, it, and you and you could maintain that that um, connection to that value over time. So with tokens, we have the opportunity to th that's just that's just sort of built it right that you can you then now have continued uh, value retention in the brand itself. So uh, so so that's like already we're we're off to the races with with Web3. And give, then, us a, give us a little example of what you're talking about, because for some people, it might be hard for them to wrap their head around what you just said. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to I'm going to jump to y'all of I, I'm sure I'm sure nouns is something that that folks are will be really familiar with. I'm trying to think of an example that's not super obscure. So nouns, um, the nouns model that was you know, sort of blew up over the summer um, continues to have a lot of attention put towards it. So um, nouns is built on this idea that uh, every there's a there's a perpetual auction mechanism. So every single day there's one NFT, um, you know, emitted. And anyone can uh, can bid on this on this NFT. And then if you if you win the bid, that's then yours. And then what you get access to is the shared treasury, right? But then you also then you you have this asset that's that's yours now. Like you you own it yourself, right? Um, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna explain the sort of value of NFTs overall, but but hopefully the you know the audience can understand sort of the basic mechanics there. So so me you know me as a, a potential nouns holder, I now have perpetual attachment to the the value of the nouns brand itself right so imagine if you had that in nike or if we had that in instagram uh, those of us who are actively creating the content and making instagram valuable like imagine if we had actual value retention 
in the Instagram brand itself. So that's that's like a, a high level example of, of how that sort of turned on its head in Web3. Cool. So uh, keep going as far as how this solves the trilemma. Yeah. So that's um, that's rev- that's a, a value retention. Um, and then if you go to distribution, so again, that's that's again, it's it's sort of built in through the network effects of tokens. I think that there are some folks who will blanket say that you know tokens themselves have network effects built in. I think that that's a little reductive. Um, but there is you know the fact that like you can me as a, I'll use nouns as an example again like. Me as a nouns, uh, you know, if I was a nouns holder, I'd be able to go and any other nouns holder, there's just already a sense of like, okay, we have shared incentive alignment here. And so I'm going to talk about your project. I'm going to talk about things that you're doing. And you're going to talk about things that I'm doing. And then popped into the nouns ecosystem, many different places online. And we have shared distribution that way. And then also as the as the meme and the brand itself expands, we continue to tap into that distribution. So and that's that's, again, enabled by the um, incentive alignment of the tokens themselves. And again, I, I want to like caution. I think there's yeah, and that's which, by the way, yeah. that's really important to talk about, right? Like yeah. the the fact that um, I'll take Proof as an example. I belong to mm-hmm. Proof, right? And I've had other members of Proof on the podcast, not because they belong to Proof, but because um, uh, it just so happened that we both belong to Proof, and and that um, and and there's only a thousand people, quote unquote, or tokens, you know, in this Proof ecosystem, right? And it's in the best interest of everybody who belongs to proof to um, kind of support each other because it increases the value of proof overall, right? And because I hold a token in proof and it's worth X amount of money, um, it's in the best interest of all the holders to do what's in the best interest of proof so that the value goes up. I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about here a little bit, right? Exactly, exactly. And I think for folks... I think for folks who are not uh, necessarily as, as deep into crypto or as not crypto native, I think another um, you know, maybe good analogy here would be like a religious community is one example. And and I and I say I say this less about the like the the dogmatic component, but like think about so I, I'm full disclosure I'm, I'm not I'm not religious I don't have any affiliation, but I have friends who are right. And anytime that you let's say you're you know you're Jewish or you're Catholic or something, you move to a new area. What do you do? The first thing you do is you try and go find the congregation, then you meet people, and so. Similarly to your experience with proof, right? Like I'm not a proof holder, but I can totally imagine myself as someone as a proof holder being like, oh, you're a proof holder. And you immediately have just like greater affiliation and more of that sense of attachment. And now it's 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 codified. It's memorialized on the blockchain and also has this piece of art that like you can then put, you know, place your identity over it. So there's so I think there's just like so much untapped power in tokens and um, and folks, you really have to experience it for yourself until you like totally understand it. Right. Kind of like kind of like a religious community in some ways. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah. I, like, I like that analogy. Uh, full disclosure: I am in a religious community as a Christian, and there isn't a financial motivation, but there is a motivation nonetheless, right? Which is a shared value system, right? So I feel like that is the other side of this: is when you belong to an exclusive community, whether it's tokenized or not. In the case of a religious community, um, there's that shared value, right? You 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 are you are aligned with that community, and as a result. There might be distribution. You could say the same thing for graduates of universities, right? Certain graduates of university alumni organizations, they want to support each other because they want to support everyone who went to that particular university, right? Yeah, exactly. I, and I think and I think maybe even the alumni organization is, is even a stronger one or, or more legible to more folks, right? But like, like I can I can totally identify with that, that if I meet someone who's an NYU grad, I just have like immediate, you know, greater affiliation with them. Exactly. So distribution has value because there's a limited amount of tokens or some sort of value associated with this group. So we've got that distribution. Now, the distribution, we should declare it's not the same as social, right? Why don't you clarify that a little bit? It's not guaranteed, just like social isn't guaranteed. As a matter of fact, you could belong and get absolutely nothing for distribution, right? Well, exactly. And I, th- I think that your clarification there is really important, right? Because I think we I think a lot of us assume that distribution is 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 um, implied both in tokens and on social, right? But in social, you're up against an algorithm that's so super opaque. You really have no idea. You know, we know about shadow banning. We know to your point about earlier about links. You know, if you put a link in the first in your first tweet, that tweet is just like not shown as much. And we see this all across the board and it's so opaque. Um, and then similarly with tokens, it's like, yeah, there's no there's no guarantee that like I'm going to if if I if I um, find myself being a nouns holder today that I suddenly am just going to like, you know, shoot to the moon on my distribution. No, it still requires you have to create something of value. 
Um, and that actually relates to this idea of um, the tools for creation, right? That like you still you still have to be making something of meaning and of value to people. Um, and the, you know the tools for creation. So you know again in, in Web two we saw we saw TikTok really um, having the mode around the video uh, the video creation tools. And in Web three, um, the thing I want to again sort of add a twist on is. We, we, we should expand our understanding of tools for creation beyond like in-app user experience or user interface. And that the tools for creation are really sort of like, what are the resources that are provided to you? And, and, in, and okay, I'm going to get a little bit nerdy here for a second, but I'll come back, I swear. Um, tools for creation, it'll, it's also another way of talking about governance, which then relates to your token design, right? So um, let's talk about the nouns uh, example. So with nouns, uh, the tools for creation there are I become a nouns holder. Um, I then have access to a shared treasury. I can I can put up a proposal that maybe I want to go throw up a skate park in my community, and I want to put a, a set of noggles, which is the um, noggles or the glasses that the nouns are, are famous for. That's sort of their meme. And I want to throw a set of noggles in the in the skate park, and like that can get approved, right? That's just like voted on. Um, one one token equals one vote. Um, and 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 yeah. So I'm not going to get too deep into the governance weeds here, but. So that I would I would look at that and say actually that's a tool for creation right because what you're doing is you're enabling folks to build something and to create something of meaning whereas on TikTok it's something you do in app whereas in DAOs it's something that you do via shared resources and shared knowledge and capital and maybe in fact you do create something that has an in app UX or UI but really what it's about is this you know bringing people together to then create things out of nothing essentially So the tools for creation in this example have to do with the funding really more than anything else right the potential funding of the creation assuming it's approved um and then with that money you can go out there and hire individuals to be able to help create this is that what i'm hearing you say yeah i would say funding and, and the other thing i'll just add an asterisk is that actually with the nouns ecosystem anybody can put up a proposal i could put up a proposal to prop house and say i want to go build a skate park even if i'm not a nouns holder and folks could could approve that that funding um i'd say it's i'd say it's i'd say it's capital allocation but I think it's it's also knowledge and resource sharing, right? So on the media side of things, um, I, we were just, you know, at Seed Club, uh, we just closed out our fifth accelerator cohort. And I was advising um, for four different projects, one of which is a new decentralized media DAO. Super excited about them. They're called Take Up Space. And the thing I was trying to um, support them in, in realizing was like, when you guys are thinking about your tools for creation, um, like set down the financial resources and think about the knowledge capital that you have around podcast production. And imagine if you could equip anyone who comes into your decentralized media DAO with that knowledge, right? So then you can you then basically pass down the ability to folks who are coming in to become their own podcast creators. And so I see that as a version of tools for creation as well, right? That essentially, you know, me, internet person, internet anon, have zero understanding of how to produce a podcast. I join Tus DAO, I join Take Up Space DAO, and then all of a sudden I have access to the shared the shared knowledge base of how to create a podcast. I could stand it up using those resources. And maybe it has nothing to do with capital. And what it really has to do with is, is again, those the sort of like tools of shared knowledge. So I'd add that twist to it as well. Let's talk about um, creating media, decentralized media a little bit. Uh, we talked about this concentric circles concept when we were prepping for this interview. Talk to us a little bit about this so people can start to wrap their head around how media is created in a decentralized way. So this this feels very related to uh, the, my you know talking about take up space just now. So you know, so my my whole my whole thesis is that any DAO needs to have its own media engine, where just you know just like in Web two brands need to have a content strategy, you need to have a social media strategy, and DAOs you need to have a media strategy as well, and so. Again, the way that we look at it at C Club is across these sort of four verticals of editorial productions, which includes audio and video, social and publicity, and then brand. And, and so for for folks, um, when they're thinking about DAOs, which again, we, we think about decentralized autonomous organization, that idea of decentralization comes out in front. Folks immediately are like, OK, if we're going to stand up a media arm, we need to go right to decentralizing the content creation, the sort of sense of like permissionless content creation. And what I was watching over the course of last year was the way that DAOs were really struggling with the quality of the content that was being created, the consistency, and then it just it created all of this additional work with with very sort of like low um, low ROI on the actual content that was being created. And so um, was was watching this pattern emerge that actually, you know, we 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 think about decentralized media as being like equated with uh, decentralized content creation, 
But there are these three, again, yeah, concentric circles of opportunity with decentralized media. And so content creation is actually it's actually at the core and the last thing that you should decentralize. And that there are these two other circles that are, that they're sort of like wider, wider out in the in the stack. And the first one being is um, uh, distribution. So you've got distribution, and then you have a smaller circle in the center, which is curation, and then you have your uh, creation at the very, very heart. So um, just to think of some examples of how that looks in practice. So decentralized distribution. This is actually just like the place where all DAOs should start. It's so it's so simple, right? Um, I think about that. Uh, Nouns is actually a great example, and then Boys Club is a, just like first of all, I love Boys Club. <laughs> Everyone should check out Boys Club. Uh, but Boys Club, they're they're really great at decentralized distribution. So anytime that a podcast comes out, um, you know, token holders, NFT holders, anyone in the community, my my Twitter feed just explodes with people talking about it. They're just like, did you hear the new podcast episode or their newsletter? Same thing. They just they rely or they they allow the community to become the storytellers and to distribute the meme of Boys Club to distribute the um, the narrative. And, and you see this in nouns as well, that like nouns holders are just the most maxi people ever. They just distribute, distribute, distribute. Um, okay. So hold on a second. Let's pause on this. So, yes. so that first of all, there's just three circles on the outer edge of the target is distribution. The next one is curation. And the one in the middle is creation, right? Yeah. And on the distribution, um, side of it, which is the biggest of the circles, if you will, the outer edge, right? Cause it's largest. Um, what I'm hearing you say is that the NFT holders or the DAO members, right? And it's either, right, um, are actively um, sharing the content, presumably on Twitter, but perhaps on other platforms as well, right? So if there's an article created or a video created or a podcast created, we see this, for example, with the Board Ape Yacht Club as they're dropping all these videos right now on Twitter and the, all the Board Ape Yacht Club members are going nuts sharing uh, the trial of Jimmy the monkey and all this, whatever the heck it is called, you know? So this is the kind of, um, creating kind of hype and buzz with content that is officially created by the entity. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Exactly. And, and there's, we have precedents for this in web too, right? I mean, minions, I mean, Disney IP, just like the way in which people create meaning out of brands as a way to, it's, it's almost like this like cultural FOMO, right? That like you're on the in because you're talking about this thing that has great meaning and, and to you and, and, and folks on the outside are like, oh, wait a minute. Like, what what is this minions meme? I want to understand this. I want I need to see this movie clearly, or like I need to listen to this boys club podcast. I need to get a board ape. You know, it's so so yeah. Relying on your community members to engage in that distribution that is like low hanging fruit for decentralization um, as it relates to media. And then yeah, keep going. Yeah. So th so the next layer in is is curation, and curation is actually the the spot where I find the most exciting, um, and I'm really excited to see like more experiments run next year. Um, the two, the two that I'll I'll mention here are Forefront, another DAO, and then Jump uh, as another an, a media. Or um, I think maybe you've actually had someone from Jump on the pod. Yeah, I uh, had another Jump, Jeff Kaufman, and I belong. Yeah. So I you know what they're doing. Yeah, I mean Jump. But jump. not everybody else is. So go ahead and tell tell everybody what they're doing. Yeah. So Jump Jump is a Jump is a, a branding and marketing DAO, um, and they have recently just shipped um, Jump News, which I am so excited about. And really, if anyone's listening to this, you have to go check it out. Um, and and yeah. So just to kind of tie it to to curation, um, and and Forefront is another great example of this. Um, I'll talk about Forefront really quick. So the way that Forefront used to run their curation is basically if you if you had a token, you had access to the Discord, right? So that's sort of you you suddenly have access to the community. There used to be a channel in the Discord where anyone could drop links into that channel. And I, and I actually think it's the same in Jump, but I, people can just, you drop links, you find, you read something that's interesting, right? I mean, everyone knows that feeling of like reading something on the internet and wanting to pass it to a friend. And then the next, but, but there's still this layer of someone um, within the DAO, within like sort of the core leadership, whether that's at Jump or Forefront, that's looking through this channel and pulling out the links that feel most aligned and most relevant for the brand. And so there is still a layer of sort of like quality control on, on the brand itself, on the brand presence and the narrative, but it's but it's fundamentally uh, sort of seeded by the community in, in decentralized curation. And then from there, you know, both Forefront and Jump then take this, take these links that they've, they've then selected and they, they put it into a newsletter and ship it out. And so then me as someone who, you know, I'm not actively curating in those communities, but I get those newsletters. I'm like, great. This is everything I need to know as it relates to like the most important media and marketing and branding um, from Jump. Okay, this is everything I need to know that relates to like the cutting edge of, of social and tokenized communities from Forefront. Uh, but they're all links that have been curated by the community. So, and there's there's just such a big design space around curation 
Um, so yeah, so that's sort of like the next layer in on. Wait, real quick on Forefront, media. if people want to check out Forefront, where do they find them? Yeah, so yeah, Forefront, um, they are, they're on Twitter. I think it's underscore Forefront. And they're actually, they're actually um, doing a new membership um, NFT um, component, which is, it's really exciting. And that's another way to sort of get tapped into participating in the curation and also receiving the newsletter. So now it's, it's token gated. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a, that's a really great one if you're interested in tokenized communities or social DAOs. Okay. So we've talked about distribution and really about engaging the community into sharing out official, whatever it is that your community is doing. We've talked about curation, which I love this concept of having everyone share into some sort of like a channel of whatever they find interesting and then having someone go through and curate the best of the best and maybe add to it whatever um, stuff isn't in that channel and ultimately um, coming out with a regular uh, newsletter. Um, Zen, uh, Zeneca does this as well with Zen Academy with a daily newsletter, which I think is really cool. Um, and and I love this because it's essentially community created mm -hmm. and curated, right? Which is what makes it different than a traditional entity where you have maybe a full-time staff member doing it. This is all being essentially and I would imagine sometimes there could even be a shout out to community members, right? And that would be a great way to facilitate more of this, right? Yeah, absolutely. And Boys Club used to do this where they would do like a community member highlight. And that, again, that's like a great way to get distribution, you know, like me as someone who's trying to build, you know, X sort of profile, like suddenly your 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 information, your 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 spotlighted and shifts to, you know, you know, 10,000 plus subscribers like that's all because you're a member and you, you've clearly created some sort of value for the organization. It's like. That, yeah, the, these kinds of like small little twists on, on these network effects is like really what's possible in Web3. So let's talk about content creation, right? Which is at the core of, the, of, of this uh, concentric target, if you will. I know a lot about that, but from your perspective as a um, Web3 entity, how ought content be created differently? Yeah, so this is the, the content creation piece. Again, the, I, we saw this trend last year where, where DAOs and uh, and folks were going immediately to decentralizing their content creation, which I think is is a very risky thing to do, especially as an early stage brand. And again, this is something that I'm sure you know and the audience could all relate to. You're talking about like mirror.xyz, that kind of stuff with the written content, or what do you mean by that? Exactly? Yeah, yeah. So mirror mirror is is more of a yeah, it's just like a very it's a Web three native um, like pu publishing platform, right? Right. Um, they now have subscriptions built in, so that that's certainly a tool you could use to basically distribute your your content create or your um, your actual content. Um, but yeah, when they so maybe just to give a specific example, so we can you know at C Club, um, we, we we sort of all all of the all of the content is basically created by myself and then Jess, um, who's our instigator, and then maybe a few other folks. Um, but we keep we really keep that group um, pretty small and pretty curated really from a, 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 a like a brand um, proliferation standpoint. It's like we want to we want to make sure that our brand is strong, um, especially that we're early stage. And and there are some folks who may always keep um, keep that content creation sort of, you know, close to home. Um, Water and Music is another really great example. Water and Music is a, a music research um, DAO there. They were previously in Web2, but really, really excellent um, high quality research reports on the music industry. Uh, and they, and so even though they're a DAO, all of their research reports are really, you know, every, everything is passed through um, the founder, Sherry, and, and, and has that, that level of, of quality control. And so they, they lean on, they'll lean on other things like distribution or curation in order to, to engage in that community decentralization. But the creation itself is still, is still um, sort of centralized. But again, I think that the, the importance here, right, because we can look in Web2 and be like, yeah, that sounds like Web2. It's like centralized content creation. And I'm like, 100%. Imagine if like for the Times, you know, you were for the New York Times, if you could curate articles for the New York Times, right? Like that were not actually published on the Times, they were published elsewhere on the internet, but still felt important and relevant to news. You know, maybe that's not a super perfect example, but you know, that that's that's like kind of what we're getting at here is that Web3 enables these just like wider, um, th these wider um, bands of, of participation in, in building brand and building media. You know, um, I'm drawn a blink on the name, but I had this gentleman on my podcast recently, and he is part of, uh, of, of Zen Academy. And he's part of the 333 club, which is the core center of their entire thing. And, um, he partnered with Zeneca to create exclusive YouTube videos that live on his personal channel, the creator's channel, 
but are distributed exclusively by Zeneca as part of the community, right? So this is where I think you could potentially start to find creators inside of the community that have special skills, maybe a writer or a video creator, right? Or an audio expert or whatever, or someone who's got a great voice and loves to do podcasts. And this is where I would imagine you could bring them in to your core, right? And have them be, even if they're not tech technically employees, you could enter into some sort of agreement with them to create content that's exclusively sponsored by Media X brand. Is that something you're seeing happen? Yeah. So, I mean, we're, you know, I think Rehash is another really good example. I don't know if you've had anyone on from Rehash. They're, they're a really excellent podcast now, but they're, they're exploring this idea of, um, you know, so, so Rehash is, is founded by uh, Diana Chen and she runs a, she runs a podcast um, where she interviews people in the Web3 space. And there's a whole like actual governance component where people vote on the guests. And it's, it's really, it's really fun. They use a joked out eco- ecosystem, but the thing I'm most interested in here is the way in which they're going to continue to expand who gets to create content under the rehash sort of brand, right? Um, and so I think that this this actually feels really relevant. Like if we think about something like a Crooked Media or like a Gimlet or a Vox um, podcast network, where you know there's you have you have the sort of like founding hosts, is the centralized host who really bring the brand forward, and but they also are the ones that are capturing most of the re, you know retaining most of the brand value, even if you have folks who are coming on and creating content under that, right? For the most part, they're not getting like any sort of persistent brand value. They're they're certainly getting some sort of compensation um, and it's most likely ad driven, but there's no sense of like persistent brand value. So if we look at rehash, if we look at the possibilities within Web3, um, you could have someone like, let's say myself, I'm a, I'm a part of the, the rehash DAO. I have an interest in standing up a podcast and I, I stand it up within the rehash ecosystem. I now, of course, you know, we'll get we'll get some sort of compensation, but then I also have persistent brand retention, persistent value retention in the rehash in the rehash brand. Then I also have governance and how we move forward with future podcasts or future, you know, future brand extensions. Um, and so, yeah, we definitely see that happening. Is like people are starting to experiment once you get that sort of, um, you know, early early product market fit, community market fit off the ground. You can then start expanding into these other you know, okay, who else can come and create valuable content here? And how can we make sure that there continue to be values aligned? I think that that's, I think we're seeing more of that next year. Yeah, it was Daniel Tenor, by the way, uh, who I forgot his name. So sorry about that, Daniel. So it, when we look at this um, concept of creating content, it sounds like start with distribution if you don't have anybody to create content, right? And then go to curation, right? And then the ultimate goal is to get to creating your own content. Is that accurate? Yeah, exactly. And and that's and that's how I that's how I would advise all the the media DAOs that are coming through or any or really any DAO that's attempting to stand up a media vertical. It's just like start with distribution, have everyone be a storyteller of your community, have them run their have them run your community story through their filter and then engage in curation. And then when you're ready, once you've got a really solid brand, you've got a solid community, you have a strong POV, then you can start inviting folks into that curation or creation process. But yeah, that's that's typically how I how I advise uh, you know DAO, DAO projects and in engaging in the decentralized media world. Steph, this has been really fascinating and a lot of like brain twisting for a lot of people to rethink how they do what they do in this Web three world. And if people want to follow you on the socials, do you have a preferred uh, platform? And if they want to connect with you um, uh, at Seed Club or any other way, how would you love for them to connect with you? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, I, I love talking to people. I really do. And I also love having my mind changed. I love hearing, I, I just, I love jamming about anything as it relates to media, especially Web3 media. But so I'm personally on Twitter and on Farcaster, increasingly more and more on Farcaster at Crypto Honey, which is Crypto H-U-N 3-Y. I'm also writing body language on Substack. So it's just like a new traditional newsletter. Um, and then of course I host Decent Media. And then, yeah, give us a follow at Seed Club. Um, we're going to do some pretty cr- incredible things in, you know, 2023. Um, we're on Twitter and Farcaster at Seed Club um, HQ. And you can also subscribe to our newsletter um, on Substack. Uh, and then, you know, of course, subscribe to our podcast, Building at the Edges, where we do, Jess, our instigator, host conversations with the top Web3 thinkers and builders. And maybe, Michael, maybe we'll have you on someday. I would love to. Steph, Alin Suggs, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your insights and answering all my millions of questions. We're way better because of it. Thank you so much, Michael. I had a blast.